Welcome everyone to this webinar about the practical potential of the extensive data reservoirs that exist within the UK public sector. My name is Chase Dave Shrigley and I'm a Principal Data Engineer at Maintech. I'm a technology leader with a highly technical background, including an MSc in Computer Science, and I've got over 22 years experience across both private and public sectors. I've been responsible for distributed multidisciplinary teams, building, architecting, delivering and maintaining highly reliable and scalable systems across a whole variety of platforms and technologies. Here at Maytech, I'm focused on empowering the public sector to deliver and continuously improve digital services that are user centric, data driven and free from legacy technology. Our agenda for today will see us taking a look at what is untapped data value and how do we find it? We'll take a look at the ways that we can assess our current state and then we'll explore just where we might want to be. Then we'll take a look at ways to get there, the potential challenges that we might be faced with before diving into a hypothetical case concerning a health department. And then finally, I'll wrap up with some key takeaways. Okay, then let's make a start. So what do we mean by untapped data value? Each department within the public sector generates and stores a substantial amount of data. But the real question is, are we optimising its value? Let's start by understanding our existing data landscape. It's a mix of rich historical data and lots of real-time inflowing data and a real variety of data sources. But all of these are not necessarily optimised for any meaningful insights. We're in an age of data proliferation. Over the decades, the UK public sector has expanded its data collection exponentially. This trend reflects the rise of digitalization and the increasing recognition of data's importance. We have huge diversity in our data sources. Our public sector isn't just a governance body, it's a treasure trove of latent insights from healthcare records to traffic patterns. And the data we've amassed has real transformative potential if we can just tap into it. However, there's a wide data utilization spectrum. Not all departments are at the same stage in terms of data utilization. Some due to earlier investments in analytics or pressing needs have progressed further than others. And recognizing this spectrum helps us target our efforts where they're needed most. We need to identify the value potential. A significant portion of our data remains underutilized. And this isn't just a missed technical opportunity, but a missed chance to enhance public service delivery, policy formation, um, and a lot more. Realizing this potential should be an important aim. And this has been recognized in the government's national data strategy. But there are challenges. The public sector isn't a monolithic organisation, it's different departments and they each face unique challenges from technical limitations to privacy concerns and I'll, I'll discuss these in more detail as we go. So how do we find this potential value? We need to acknowledge that the age of merely collecting and storing data is behind us. Now it's about extracting relevant insights, focusing on quality and fostering an environment where data informs decision making. There are limitations of traditional metrics. Data maturity assessments, while beneficial, primarily they offer a linear view. They track our progression in data management and usage, but they often don't capture the nuances or the broader ecosystem's interconnectedness. Maturity models may not always factor in unique challenges or the diverse nature of data within the public sector. We need a holistic data utilization approach. Data isn't just about collection, storage, and periodic analysis. It's about creating a continuously adaptive data-informed culture. And this means recognizing data's potential to influence policy decisions, improve public service delivery, predict future trends, and foster innovation. By looking beyond maturity assessments, we can exploit data's full spectrum of capabilities. And this means prioritizing outcomes over processes. For instance, a department might achieve a high maturity rating, but may not necessarily harness its data to make a tangible difference in citizens' lives. 
Our ultimate goal is to ensure that data drives real world beneficial change for UK citizens. We want to be as ready as we can be for the future. The data landscape is ever evolving. New technologies, methodologies and challenges emerge regularly. And by transcending traditional maturity metrics, we position ourselves to be more adaptive and responsive to future shifts. Ensuring the public sector remains at the forefront of data-driven innovation. Another area of focus should be inclusivity and collaboration. Data maturity can sometimes be department-centric, but the future of public sector data lies in collaboration, sharing insights, methodologies and best practices across departments. By looking beyond maturity, we foster an environment where data becomes a collaborative tool, breaking down silos and enhancing interdepartmental synergy. In essence, we need a paradigm shift. From viewing data as a checkbox activity measured by maturity levels to seeing it as an invaluable asset that, when harnessed fully, can drive transformational change across the public sector. So how, how do we go about this paradigm shift? Well, you could start by choosing a framework that encapsulates a roadmap for data utilisation transformation and involves the following key activities. Diagnostic and analysis. It's important to first get a clear understanding of our current data practices. Are we merely collecting data or are we analysing it effectively? How integrated are our data sources across departments? We need to identify where we stand in terms of data collection, utilisation and integration. Benchmarking. Comparing our current data practices against leading standards and identifying gaps. How do we measure up against leading practices both domestically and internationally? This helps us spot our strengths and areas that need attention. And setting objectives. We need a clear vision, clearly defining what we hope to achieve in terms of data extraction, analysis and application. And this means setting smart, specific, measurable, achievable, relevant and time bound objectives that will guide our efforts. Strategy formulation, once we know where we, we are and where we want to be, we can chart the course, outlining concrete steps to move from the current state to the future state. This might involve procuring new tools, enhancing collaboration across departments or investing in training for our staff. Implementation and iteration, the journey doesn't end when we put our plans into action. The data landscape is ever evolving and so must our strategies be. This calls for continuous assessment, learning and refinement of our methods. This means putting plans into action and continuously reassessing and refining our approaches, approaches based on the actual outcomes. With this framework, we're not just aiming for short term uh, wins. We're building a foundation for sustained excellence in utilisation for the public sector. Okay, let's take a deep dive into each of those key activities then. So before we can strategize, let's evaluate what data sources are we using? How are we analyzing this data? And how does it influence our decisions? Performing a data reservoir audit before we harness our data, this means that we must know its breadth and depth. This entails identifying every data source, whether it's a frequently used CRM system or a lesser known departmental database. Knowing where our data lies is the first step in unlocking its potential. Carrying out an analysis proficiency. Okay, so understanding the proficiency of our teams is vital. This doesn't just mean tool proficiency, but also the ability to draw actionable insights from the data. It's about gauging both technical and the analytical skills currently present. Measuring the impact our current data is making. Data for the sake of data serves little purpose. We need to assess how our current data practices influence policy making, decision driving and service provision. Are we truly data informed? or are we missing out on key insights? A thorough look at, at our data governance and compliance. In the realm of public data, trust 
is paramount. We need a thorough understanding of our governance policies, ensuring they're compliant with all legal and ethical standards, ensuring the integrity, privacy and security of all our data assets. And then there's collaboration and integration. Data in silos is a lost opportunity. By understanding how well different departments share and, and integrate data, we can identify collaboration gaps and potential synergies. By understanding our strengths and areas of improvement, we can chart a more informed path forward. So where do we want to be? We want to aim for data-informed decision-making. As we move forward, data will become the keystone of our decision-making processes. We're, we're not just talking about back-end me metrics. It's about integrating insights directly into policy formulation and strategic initiatives. This approach ensures our decisions are rooted in factual, real-time intelligence, optimising outcomes for all stakeholders. And personalised public services. One size does not fit all. With the power of analytics and AI, we can shift from generic services to those tailored to individual citizens' needs. Imagine healthcare that considers a patient's entire history or urban planning that takes into account local residents' feedback and behaviour patterns. With predictive analysis, instead of being reactive, our goal is to be proactive. With advanced analytics, we can foresee potential challenges, be it in an emerging healthcare crisis or urban infrastructure needs. By anticipating these issues, we can allocate resources more efficiently and take timely actions, potentially averting crises. But we're gonna need interdepartmental synergy. The future isn't about isolated data pools, but rather an interconnected ecosystem. By breaking down data silos and fostering collaboration between departments, we harness the power of collective intelligence. This integrated approach will lead to a more comprehensive um, insights and holistic uh, solution. And all of this will help create an empowered workforce. The, the potential of data isn't just about external services, it's also about enhancing our internal capabilities. We envisage a future where our workforce, our workforce across all levels is equipped with cutting edge tools and the skills to use them, where continuous learning and, and ad, 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 adaptation become the norm, ensuring our teams are always ahead of the curve. In essence, we want a future where data isn't just an operational tool, but the central driving force behind a more efficient, effective and citizen-centric UK public sector. OK, so how do we get there then? To harness data's transformative potential, we must first ensure we have a strong and scalable foundation. We need to build a robust infrastructure. This means investing in state-of-the-art data storage, management and processing tools. It's not just about quantity, but quality. Our systems should be capable of handling diverse data types, ensuring data integrity and facilitating seamless access while ensuring security. But the best tools are only as good as the hands that wield them. Our public sector workforce must be equipped with the skills to navigate the evolving data landscape. This involves ongoing training sessions, workshops and courses tailored to various roles, from data novices to seasoned analysts. By fostering a culture of continuous learning, we ensure our teams remain agile and adaptive. And data's potential magnifies when viewed as a collective asset. We should aim to foster a collaborative ecosystem where departments share insights, tools and best practices. By leveraging shared platforms and interdisciplinary teams, we can tackle complex challenges more holistically, ensuring the best minds are always at the table. The journey to data excellence, though, isn't a one-off project. It's an ongoing process. And by establishing regular feedback loops with both internal teams and the public, we ensure our approaches remain relevant and effective. Whether it's refining a data model or improving a public service, feedback becomes our compass, guiding us towards better outcomes. But trust is paramount. 
As we delve deeper into data utilisation, we must ensure our practices are transparent, ethical and aligned with privacy regulations. And this means implementing robust data governance frameworks, ensuring informed consent and regularly reviewing our methodologies to align with evolving ethical standards. The roadmap to a data-driven future isn't just around tools and tech, it's a comprehensive approach that interweaves infrastructure, people, collaboration, feedback and ethics. It's a journey we undertake with clarity, commitment and a collective spirit. Before we embark on the journey, it's crucial to understand where we stand and where we wish to be. This involves a thorough analysis of our existing data practices, infrastructure, skills and outcomes. By identifying gaps, we can prioritise areas needing immediate attention and allocate resources effectively. Once we've identified the gaps, the next step is crafting a strategic roadmap. This isn't just a timeline, but a comprehensive plan detailing initiatives, KPIs, responsibilities and milestones. The roadmap acts as our navigational chart, ensuring all departments and stakeholders have clarity on the direction and their roles in the journey. Change, especially on a large scale, can be daunting, and that's why I'd recommend starting with pilot initiatives. These are smaller controlled projects that allow us to test new methodologies, tools or strategies. Pilots provide invaluable insights, highlight potential roadblocks and give a glimpse of the potential benefits, thus building momentum for larger scale changes. Successful pilots, though, shouldn't remain isolated successes. The next phase involves scaling these initiatives to broader departments or the entire public sector. Alongside scaling, integration is key. This means ensuring that new methodologies or tools seamlessly integrate with existing systems fostering synergy rather than discord. And of course, we need continuous review and iteration. The world of data is dynamic. What's effective today might be obsolete tomorrow. Therefore, our journey isn't linear, but cyclical. Continuous reviews, feedback collection and iterations ensure we, we remain on the right path, adjusting our sails as the winds of change blow. Transitioning to a data-driven future is not a leap but a deliberate phased progression. By understanding our current state, crafting a roadmap, testing our strategies, scaling successes and continuously refining our approach, we can bridge the gap between today's challenges and tomorrow's potential. Okay, let's revisit the first step to deriving value from data then, understanding what you have. This means creating a comprehensive inventory or a catalogue of all data assets across the public sector. So cataloguing isn't merely about listing data sets, but documenting their sources, um, their last, last date that they were updated, the team responsible for them, and all associated metadata. And tools like data catalogues or data management platforms can aid this process. Once we know what data we possess, we need to assess its quality. And this means identifying any gaps, errors or inconsistencies that could impair its utility. Techniques like profiling, which gives an overview of our data quality issues. Different departments or sources might have varying formats or units for similar data. For instance, dates might be formatted differently or measurement units might vary. This can create challenges in analysis. So implementing a consistent standard ensures that data from multiple sources can be integrated seamlessly and automated processes can assist in, in maintaining this consistency. Redundant or duplicated data not only consumes unnecessary st storage, but it can also skew analysis. Identifying and removing such redundancies is important. And deduplication tools or algorithms can scan data sets for repeated entries, ensuring that each piece of data is unique and relevant. And con continuous monitoring, so data discovery and cleaning, isn't a one-off task. As new data gets added and older data gets updated, maintaining quality becomes an ongoing commitment. Implementing tools that monitor data quality in real time and flagging inconsistencies or errors as they arise can ensure that the public sector's data assets remain reliable and actionable. 
data discovery and cleaning form the bedrock of all subsequent data initiatives. Without a clear understanding of what data assets are available and then ensuring they're of the highest quality, efforts in analytics, machine learning, or any data-driven decision-making might be compromised. Investing time and resources in these foundational steps ensures that every subsequent layer built on this foundation is robust and reliable. And so in a diverse public sector landscape, it's crucial that we're all speaking the same language when it comes to data. So establishing a unified data lexicon ensures clarity and reduces potential misunderstandings. This could involve creating glossaries, documentation, or even training modules to ensure terms, metrics, and methodologies are consistent across departments. Um, you could have cross-departmental workshops. One department's challenge could be another success story. By organising workshops that bring together teams from different sectors, we foster an environment of shared learning. And these sessions could be centred around problem solving, brainstorming, or even demonstrations of successful data initiatives, providing valuable insights and spurring innovation. A shared vision isn't just about collaboration between departments, but ensuring that stakeholders at all levels, from, from the frontline workers through to the top tier management, that they're all aligned. And this involves regular communication about goals, progress and benefits. Demonstrating early wins can significantly aid in getting buy-in, creating momentum for larger scale initiatives. Collaboration isn't a one-off event though, but a continual dialogue. Establishing dedicated channels, be it digital platforms, regular meetings, or even suggestion boxes, ensures that feedback flows seamlessly. This dialogue fosters a sense of ownership and involvement, ensuring that potential issues are flagged early and innovations are continually shared. It's important to celebrate collaborative milestones though. Recognising and celebrating collective achievements plays a pivotal role in fostering collaboration. Whether it's a successful cross-departmental project or achieving a data-related milestone, such celebrations highlight the value of working together. Beyond just morale, it reinforces the idea that in the journey of data transformation, collective victories far outweigh isolated successes. Collaboration and a shared vision are not just strategic imperatives, but the very lifeblood of a successful data-driven transformation. By speaking the same language, sharing learnings, aligning stakeholders, maintaining open dialogue and celebrating collective achievements, we pave the way for a holistic synergistic evolution. It's also important to have transparent data collection. In the realm of public sector, transparency isn't just a best practice, it's a mandate. Every, every time data is collected, its purpose, source and application should be clear. By effectively communicating why we're gathering specific data and how it will be used, we foster an environment of trust and understanding. Public consultations and open forums can really help in this transparency. But with the increasing volume of data, it's essential to safeguard the personal and sensitive information of our citizens. Data should be an anonymised wherever possible and stringent encryption measures should be in place. Additionally, we must abide by legal frameworks like GDPR, ensuring that data is handled, stored and deleted in compliance with established regulations. As data-driven decisions become integral, it's important to ensure that these decisions are free from biases. Whether it's machine learning models or data collection methodologies, actively seeking and eliminating biases ensures fairness. Regular audits, third-party reviews and inclusive data teams can play a crucial role in mitigating potential biases in our data processes. And also there's governance frameworks. To maintain ethical standards, governance frameworks are essential. These frameworks set clear rules regarding data access, usage, sharing, and disposal. 
by establishing roles and responsibilities, setting up data committees and conducting regular reviews, we, we ensure accountability at every stage of the data life cycle. And ultimately, all these measures culminate in one primary goal, upholding the trust of our citizens. Our responsibility is to ensure that the public's data is used to enhance their welfare and not misused or mishandled. Regular public reports, open data initiatives and feedback channels can play a significant role in fostering and maintaining this trust. As we embark on this data-driven journey, our moral compass must be as strong as our technical prowess. By ensuring transparent, private, unbiased, governed and trust-centric practices, we stand by our commitment to serve the public ethically and responsibly. But we also have to be aware of data silos. Within large organisations, especially the public sector, different departments often store and manage their data independently, and these are known as data silos. And while these silos can cater to, to departments' specific needs, they pose challenges when attempting to get a holistic view or when cross-departmental analysis is required. And so overcoming these silo silos is the first step to successful data integration. Instead of disparate systems across departments, leveraging unified platforms ensures all data is accessible from a central location. This doesn't mean all data is stored in one place, but that it can be accessed and analysed cohesively. Solutions like data warehouses or data lakes, especially those on cloud platforms, can enable such unified access, ensuring that data from various departments can be queried together seamlessly and standardised data formats. Data standardisation is crucial for integration, and this means ensuring that every department adheres to agreed upon formats, terminologies and units. Not merely a technical under undertaking, but often requires collaboration and consensus building across departments. Establishing a central data governance body can really help in laying down and enforcing these standards. So beyond the technical aspects, Successful data integration requires a culture shift. Departments need to view data not as their individual asset, but as a collective resource. Regular interdepartmental meetings, workshops and shared projects can foster this sense of collective ownership and vision. Encouraging a culture where data is freely but responsibly shared can break down barriers and improve integration. While integration aims to make data more accessible, it's essential to strike a balance with data protection and privacy. Not all data should be accessible to all individuals or, in, or, or departments. Clear government policies, role-based access controls and audit trails ensure that while data is integrated and available, it's also protected and used responsibly. Integrating data across departments is both a technical and a cultural journey. It requires robust platforms, standards and tools, but equally it demands collaboration, trust and a shared vision among the departments. When executed well, it can transform isolated data assets into a powerful, cohesive resource that can drive better decision making across the entire public sector. but it's going to require commitment from leadership. The most transformative shifts in organisational culture often stem from the top. Leadership must not only support data initiatives, but actively champion them. This means being vocal about the value of data, dedicating resources to data initiatives and leading by example. For the public sector, this could manifest in regular data strategy reviews at, at exec meetings, visible participation in data workshops, or even public talks emphasising the role of data in enhancing public services. And continuous learning. The data landscape is constantly evolving. Ensuring everyone stays informed and skilled is crucial. Consider establishing regular workshops and training programmes focused on data literacy and advanced data techniques. Partnerships with universities or data focused institutions can also be beneficial, bringing in external expertise and fresh perspectives. But it's not enough to preach the value of data. Teams need to have the right tools and resources to act on it. 
invest in modern data platforms and tools, ensuring that they're accessible and user friendly, and also ensure that there's a support structure in place, perhaps a dedicated data team or help desk to assist other departments in their data endeavours. It also requires open communication. Building a data ready culture involves breaking down any barrier, barriers to communication. Every individual should feel comfortable raising questions, offering feedback or suggesting new data driven initiatives. Regular forums or town hall meetings where data projects are discussed can be valuable and such platforms encourage dialogue, help in addressing concerns and foster a sense of collective ownership of the data journey. Recognising and celebrating data can boost morale and further embed the value of data within the organisational psyche. Whether it's a successful project outcome, an innovative data-driven solution, or even an individual accomplishment in data training, taking the time to highlight and applaud these successes. Such recognitions, whether it's through awards or internal communications, reinforce the value of data and motivate continued excellence. Building a data ready culture in the public sector is both an endeavour and an opportunity. It's about creating an environment where data isn't just a tool, but a fundamental part of the decision making process, leading to enhanced public services and informed strategies. But many departments often stop at basic descriptive analytics, which merely represents what has already happened. And the true power lies in predictive ana analytics, where we anticipate future trends and patterns. For instance, by analysing historical data on public service usage um, during certain times of the year, we can anticipate future demands and allocate resources more efficiently. Machine learning and artificial intelligence are tools that can help the public sector identify patterns that might not be apparent to human analysts. Um, consider traffic management. Using ML, we can predict traffic congestion based on various factors, leading to better urban planning and public transport scheduling. And there's also custom analytic solutions. You can get off the shelf analytical tools where they're useful, but the unique challenges of the public sector may require customised solutions. Whether it's in public health, transportation or public safety, tailored tools can provide more accurate and relevant insights. And collaborating with data scientists and engineers to develop these solutions ensures that we're not just leveraging generic tools, but tools fine-tuned for our specific data sets and challenges. In today's fast-paced world, waiting for end-of-month reports isn't always feasible. Real-time analytics allows for decisions to be made on the fly based on the most current data available. An example might be in an emergency response, Real-time data on, on, on an un unfolding situation can help allocate emergency services more effectively, potentially even saving lives. Advanced analytics is not a one-time activity. Setting up feedback loops means that the insights derived from the data are continually used to refine processes, which in turn produce new data to be analysed. This iterative process ensures that our analytical models are continuously updated, refined and improved upon. It fosters a culture of on ongoing learning and optimization. It's important to stress that advanced analytics, when leveraged correctly, can be a game changer. It provides the tools to not only understand our current situation, but to anticipate future challenges and opportunities. It allows for proactive rather than reactive decision making, ensuring the public sector remains agile, efficient and effective in serving the public. OK, so let's take a look at potential challenges then. There's data priv privacy concerns. In the age of GDPR and heightened public awareness about data privacy, ensuring confidentiality confidentiality of collected data is paramount. A possible solution could be to implement robust encryption um, to, sa to safeguard the data, use of anonymization techniques to remove personally identifiable information, 
um, ensures that the data analysis doesn't compromise individual privacy. Regularly review and update data handling policies to stay compliant with evolving regulations. There's also a problem of data silos across departments. As already discussed, it's common for different departments within the public sector to operate in silos, leading to fragmented and isolated data pools. A possible solution is the government's national data strategy seeks to address this challenge by promoting cross-departmental data sharing. It advocates fostering a culture of collaboration, encouraging departments to work together, share insights and align their data strategies. Then there's the problem of quality and consistency of data. Inconsistent or low quality data can lead to inaccurate insights, undermining the value of any data driven initiative. And one way to alleviate this would be to via regular data audits to identify and rectify inconsistencies. Establish standard operating procedures for data collection, ensuring uniformity across all departments, and implement regular automated data cleaning processes to maintain the integrity of data sets. Then there's the skill gaps in data engineering, science, and analysis. Not every department may have the expertise to build platforms needed or extract meaningful insights from their data. However, they could invest in continuous training programs, equipping staff with the latest data tools and techniques. They could also collaborate with external export, uh, experts or data consultants when needed, tapping into their specialised knowledge to bridge any gaps and mentor their employees. And then, of course, there's the problem of resistance to change. Transitioning to a data centric approach can be met with resistance, particularly from those accustomed to traditional methods. It's vital to engage all stakeholders early on, explaining the benefits and value of a data driven approach. Demonstrate qu quick wins or early successes to build confidence and show tangible results. Provide support and resources to ease the transition ensuring everyone feels equipped and empowered to embrace the new approach. While the journey to unlock the value of untapped data may present challenges with proactive strategies and a solutions oriented mindset, these hurdles can be effectively addressed. The potential rewards in terms of improved efficiency, public service and insights far outweigh the challenges. Let's think about a hypothetical case. Let's say a health department. One of the ongoing challenges faced by many health departments today is the increasing wait times for patients, impacting patient satisfaction and potentially even health outcomes. And a possible goal could be to understand the root causes and devise strategies to address them. When identifying the data sources, we could employ a comprehensive data driven approach using electronic health records that provide a wealth of data about patient visits, times and treatments, along with patient feedback surveys to gain insights into patients' experiences and potential areas of dissatisfaction. We could also use staff rotors and schedules to help us understand human resource allocation and its impact on wait times. With these data sources, time series analysis could be conducted to understand trends and patterns in wait times across different hours of the day, days of the week and even seasons. Additionally, bottleneck identification processes could be used by mapping out the patient's journey from entry to exit and measuring times at each stage. The department could pinpoint where delays were most significant. Was it at reception, during diagnostics, waiting for a particular treatment? And then a possible outcome could be armed with these insights, the health department could implement several changes. For instance, if delays were found during certain times of the day due to a rush of patients, additional staff could be scheduled during those, those periods. If a particular diagnostic machine was identified as a bot bottleneck, efforts could be made to optimise its usage or invest in additional equipment. The result could be a tangible reduction in patient wait times, leading to improved patient satisfaction and crucially better health outcomes as patients received more timely care. 
However, the success of this, this initiative would not mean the end of the analytical approach. The department would need to set up continuous monitoring tools to keep an eye on the wait times and other metrics, ensuring that any future challenges could be swiftly identified and addressed. Patient feedback must be continuously solicited and integrated, ensuring the solutions remained patient-centric. Our hypothetical health department case shows how a methodical data-driven approach can transform a significant challenge into an opportunity for improvement. It illustrates that with the right data, analytical tools and a commitment to continuous improvement, even complex public sector challenges can be effectively addressed. Okay, so let's have a look at the key takeaways then. The untapped potential. As we've discussed, our data repositories are like mines brimming with potential insights. We've only scratched the surface. The real challenge and opportunity lies in digging deeper, asking the right questions and seeking transformative answers that can reshape the way we serve the public. The power of data is magnified when combined with collaborative efforts. The public sector strength lies in its diverse departments and teams. By fostering cross-departmental collaborations and data sharing, we can harness our collective knowledge for greater good. And then there's continuous evolution. Data maturity isn't a destination, but an ongoing journey. As technology evolves and our capabilities grow, we must continuously strive to elevate our data strategies ensuring we, we remain at the cutting edge of public service innovation. At the heart of our data endeavours is our commitment to the public. Every insight drawn, every decision made is directed towards enhancing public services, ensuring transparency and building a more connected, informed and resilient society. And as for next steps, as we move forward, it's essential to carry the momentum from today's discussion. Let's challenge ourselves to prioritise data in our strategies, invest in building our skills and capabilities, and continually seek opportunities to transform our data into actionable insights. In our data lies the power to redefine, reimagine, and revolutionise the public services we offer if we embrace this data-driven future. This webinar is just one in MadeTech's regular series all about data called The Pipeline. And details on how you can subscribe are on the events section of our website. Please check it out if you get a chance. Thank you for your time today. And if you'd like to continue the conversation or find out more about the framework that MadeTech offers, please feel free to reach out to one of us. Here on the screen are my, my uh, contact details, but equally, there's a contact section on the main tech web website.